look at market quotes, how to read market quotes. We don't actually have to look at them anymore. If you know how to read a stock quote, you know how to read a futures quote. It, it, uh, it pretty much is the same thing. There is a distinction, though. The market quotes, whenever we're looking at the market price of any futures contract, it is stated as the price per unit, not the price per contract. For instance, oil is for each contract is for a thousand barrels, but the price is quoted for one barrel. So when you see oil trading at $45 a barrel, that's for one. That doesn't mean the futures contract is worth 45 bucks. It is worth $45,000. So those are two separate things. In any quote, we'll have the price at which it opened, the high of the day, the lows, low of the day. And I put the word close here, but it's not really called close. And the reason I used uh, open, high, low, close is if you're used to uh, the open, high, low, close uh, uh, bar charts, you notice that, you know, that they look like this, where this, the tick on this side is the open. Uh, the top of the stick is the high, the bottom of the stick is the low, and the other stick is the close, so it's called an open, high, low, close bar chart. Uh, in futures, we don't really use the word close, you use the word settlement price. Uh, so let's say that the futures close at 215, right at 215. So the very last trade that occurs at 215 becomes the settlement price. So you call it the close, but... It also has another name called the settlement price. And the settlement price is what's used for daily settlement. Now, sometimes trading doesn't stop on the close. So there could be a close. For instance, I'll give you two examples down here. It depends, the, 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 the settlement time, the time that's used for close depends on the contract. For instance, the grains close at 215. That's the settlement, that 215 sharp. Whatever the last trade is at 215 is the settlement price. It also happens to be that grain stopped trading at 215. So at 215.01, that's it. It's over. But energy, oil, for example, closes at 230. So the 230 trade, the closest to exactly 230, becomes the settlement price. But oil continues to trade through 230. So 230 comes and goes, and if you're trading oil, 230, 230 point, uh, 230 in six seconds, 230 in 10 seconds, 231, 232, 240, 250, you trade right through. So that the close for oil and the settlement close, there's one, there's a close for oil that sets the settlement price, and then there's a close for trading itself in oil that day, which I believe is five o'clock or. 515 I think it might be 515 then it reopens at six o'clock I'm not entirely sure on on how it makes the switch over to Globex but again just to just just to be very clear some contracts stop trading on the close and that's the settlement some have a settlement time 230 for energy is the settlement time but that is not the close of trading however when trading reopens at 6 p.m. The previous close is not the close that happened at 515, but the close that happened at 230. It sets the close and the settlement, but trading does continue through. Just be aware. Trading volume and open interest. Volume and open interest can be a little bit tricky, so let me go through just a really simple example for you, and then you can complicate it up yourself. Let's say on day one, there's a buyer and a seller that enter into a contract. One contract is open. Uh, so the volume is one, and how many contracts are open at that time? One. That's called open interest. The next day, there's a new buyer and seller that come along. Trading volume for the day is one, but open interest is now two because there are two contracts in existence. Volume was one, but open interest is now two. On day three, the original buyer and seller from day one reverse their positions and close it out. So trading volume is one, but open interest drops from two down to one because now there's only one contract open, the one that occurred on day two. So open interest is the sum of all contracts still open as of the end of that day. Trading volume is the volume of trades in that day. So you can have a buyer and a seller that enter into and close out a contract 10 times during the course of the day. The trading volume would be 10, but if they completely nullify each other, open interest would be zero, would increment by zero. So volume 
and open interest represent two different things. Volume is the sheer volume of contracts traded in the day. Open interest is, as of closing, how many contracts are still in existence. Finally, let's look at patterns. We're going to look more at patterns in Chapter 5. I'm just going to introduce you to the concept, an upward sloping futures curve. When we talk about a futures curve, it means we take the month of January or whatever the next month is, and we plot a price. Then we take the next month and you plot a price. The next month, etc., etc. So the further out you go in time, uh, you might get a futures price curve that looks like this. This is called the normal market, an upward sloping futures curve. But sometimes you can have a month, uh, the front month could be priced here, then the next month is priced lower, etc., 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 and each month is priced lower and lower and lower and heading downwards into the future. This is called an inverted market. Uh, and it's usually these, these two also go by different names. If you've ever heard the terms contango and, and uh, backwardation, um, this is what we're talking about. I shouldn't say that's what we're talking about. It's kind of what we're talking about. Uh, they refer to the same thing, but for different reasons. Uh, we're going to look at that more in Chapter 5, so I just want to introduce you to the terminology of it now, and then we'll get into the mechanics of what causes these to look the way they do when we get there. It was mentioned in contract specifications about delivery locations, delivery times, etc. Well, it turns out very few contracts actually lead to delivery. Very few of them do. They're usually closed out, uh, especially for speculators, even for hedgers, even for hedging. When they want to take delivery, even when they want the underlying asset, they'll typically close out their position in the futures market and then just use whatever profit they have to go buy in the spot market because delivery can be expensive and inconvenient if it's not in a location that's near where you are but there might be a spot market uh, or, or a market for delivery closer to where you are. So they're usually closed out by both speculators and hedgers. The delivery itself, the time period, now notice it's not the day, it's the time period. Usually delivery happens over a period of time, not just a specific day uh, uh, that we like we have in stock options but over a period of time, and that's set by the exchange from uh, this date uh, to this date, uh, delivery occurs. The date, the actual date of delivery, is decided on by that the person or the contract holder with the short position. Now, why the person with the contract uh, the, uh, on the short side? Because they have to deliver. Only they can know exactly what day they're going to have the asset ready to be delivered and when, when it's going to get to the destination. The long side can't close because if there's no one that can actually deliver on that date, then it can't happen. So it makes sense that the short, uh, uh, the short position sets the date of delivery. When the short position is going to deliver, they deliver a notice of intention to deliver to the exchange. The notice of intention will specify the number of contracts, the location at which they will deliver, and the grade that they're going to deliver. The exchange then chooses a party a long party, choose a party with a long position. Typically, they'll start with the oldest long outstanding position first, simply because if it's the oldest one and it's been held that long and it's not closed, there is an intention to take delivery, or at least a safer bet that there's an intention to take delivery. So that'll be selected first. This is delivery of the underlying asset versus cash settlement. Some futures contracts cannot be delivered. It's almost impossible to deliver them. So they're cash settled. Uh, most financial futures are of this type, especially on indices. So let's take the S&P 500. There are two contracts on that. The mini S&P 500, which has a ticker ES. By the way, the mini is by far the more liquid of the two. And then there's the SPX, which is for 250 times the index. The SPX was the original, the mini came later, and the mini is so much more popular uh, than the SPX. But here's the thing. If you were going to deliver the S&P 500, not every stock in the index can be, can, it, it ends up being a whole unit. And since you cannot buy fractions of a share to deliver, you cannot possibly deliver the index. So something like delivering the S&P 500 index, all the stocks in the index at the weight that they're in the index by is impossible. 
it can't be done because you'll have fractions of shares. You can't deliver fractions of shares. So in that case, they are cash settled and there is no delivery of the underlying asset. You don't even have to worry about closing out your position before the delivery period because there is no delivery. Well, these are the last issues we have to cover in Chapter 2. Order types, regulation, and accounting and tax. And I'm going to go rather quickly over these because you can't do them justice. And, and I don't want it to turn into a real discussion of order types, regulation, and accounting. You can fill whole courses on just these three issues. For order types, I've listed three, market, limit, and stop. A market order means you're going to buy at whatever, whatever the price is or sell at whatever the price is. Buy on the bid, uh, sorry, buy on the offer or sell on the bid. A limit order means you specify the price. Now, if you've ever traded uh, in the futures market, when you uh, initiate an order, the default will be a limit price. The default will be a limit price. Unlike a stock transaction when you initiate an order, the default will be a market price. The reason for this is because it is highly recommended, highly recommended, especially with derivatives, options and futures, to always use a limit order to specify your price rather than taking a chance. So in the stock, if you're, if you're doing an equity transaction, the default will be a market order. You must change it to a limit order. In, or in, in a futures or options uh, market, when you're placing an order, your default will automatically be a limit order. If you want it to be market order, you can set it for that. But once you hit transmit, you'll probably get a warning that says, warning, you're submitting a market order. Uh, you might want to change it to a limit, just to be aware. Then number three, you have a stop. A stop is a modifier. A stop is a modifier that you place on an order, either a buy stop or a stop loss. Since we're dealing with futures, it's just as easy to be short as it is to be long. You need a margin account for both, so it's not as if being short is something very different like it is in stocks. It's the same thing. It's the same margin for the long position as the short position. So you have to get used to both of these terms. A buy stop is if you're short, you want you need to buy to close. So you have a stop saying, listen, if the price goes to this level, that's my stop. That's a buy stop. If you're long, you have a stop loss. So that if the price is dropping, you say, this is where I'm stopping out, and that'll be my loss. So buy stops and stop losses, these are meant to limit your losses. Typically, you'd enter them in at the time of your limit order. So you'd buy... Uh, uh, let's say an asset at uh, $40 or a contract at $40 per unit uh, with a stop loss maybe at uh, $39.20 or $39.50 depending on what your tolerance for pain is. Now at the end you see that I've specified that um, for the limit or the stop they can be either a day which is the default it's just a day order or a good till cancelled but not so with market. Why not? Because market uh, executes immediately at whatever at wherever the market is so there is no concept of it being a day or a good till cancelled order it's an immediate order so that modifier doesn't apply now there are many many more orders and order types many more and depending on your broker and the platform that they use and the power they give you you can get into some really exotic order types I could fill the next three hours just talking about order types but I'm not going to this is this is not a course on order types. It's a course on futures and options. This is this is actually in the technicalities of executing a trade, which is beyond what we're talking about really. But just be aware, there are many many more order types. Regulation. I'm just going to briefly hit on this. Futures markets are regulated by the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Want to find out more about them? Visit their website. Dodd Frank Act expands CFT oversight. To OTC markets doesn't mean completely but suddenly the CFTC has more oversight of what goes on in the OTC markets than they used to uh, thanks to the credit crisis of 2008 and uh, two brave uh, uh, um, two brave individuals in the US government uh, uh, that uh, that uh, co co-sponsored this bill accounting and tax while well, accounting look what I say look it up 
there are ways to treat uh, uh, the gains from futures uh, depending on whether you're a hedger or depending on whether you're a speculator uh, of how you account in the books for the uh, market value of the securities. This is not an accounting course. It's not intended to be. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's really just uh, pointing out that, listen, uh, there is an accounting treatment for how you deal with these, uh, with these contracts depending on why you're holding them. So you got to look it up. Tax, I couldn't even possibly do this justice. Tax is different in every country. Uh, there may be some commonalities between every country, but it's different in every country. So rather than to start mentioning, well, there's this kind of tax on this, or this is considered this type of income, and this is considered that type of income, and a difference between short-term and long-term capital gains, I'm just going to pass on that altogether. And if you're interested in the tax treatment of these particular derivatives, um, look in your own country's tax code because there's going to be all sorts of exceptions of whether or not you're holding the underlying asset and the derivative, when you bought the derivative, what you bought the derivative for, why, how long you're going to hold it, what's your cost basis. It just goes on and on. So it's easier just to, for the accounting, if you're interested, look it up. For the tax treatment, if you're interested, look it up. It's just mentioned here to say that, hey, you know what? <laughs> there's an accounting uh, issues you got to deal with, and there's tax issues you got to deal with. That wraps up Chapter 2. We're going to move on now into Chapter 3 and look at some hedging strategies.